Welcome to In and Around War, a podcast of the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights on contemporary issues related to wars. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode zero of the new podcast series of the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights in and around words. My name is Paula Gaeta. I'm a professor of international law at the Graden Institute of International and Development Studies, which is known as the Geneva Graden Institute. I was a director of the Geneva Academy together with my colleague and friend, Professor Andrew Clapham, and I regularly teach a course on international criminal law at the LLM program of the Geneva Academy. I'm here today with the other two co-hosts of this new podcast series. Hello, Paola, and welcome to our listeners. My name is Antonio Coco, and I teach international law at the University of Essex. I am also a former student, uh, an alumnus of the Geneva Academy, and a former teaching assistant at the Geneva Academy. A very warm welcome to everyone also from my side. My name is Anna Sorin Corali, and I'm a teaching assistant at the Geneva Academy and a PhD candidate at the Geneva Graduate Institute, where I research on responsibility for international crimes and omissions. We are here today to explain the main features of this new podcast series. Uh, Yes, Paola. This series explores contemporary issues that are related to wars, and we do it from the perspective of international law. We feel that this perspective is often marginalized in uh, in the media discussions about the issue of war, and it's perhaps confined often to a public of specialists. Uh, we want to take a different approach in this podcast. We want to bring these themes to the wider public and discuss the issues in an accessible way. The issues that we will be discussing during this podcast will really be very interesting and inspiring. Just to mention a few forthcoming episodes, they will relate to terrorism and war, accountability for international crimes, and the role of non-governmental organizations that work in war zones. I think that the topics that Anna has just um, mentioned uh, should clarify already whom we hope to reach. Uh, We aim at uh, anyone who is interested in understanding what are the main challenges uh, that arise when international law tries to address wars, uh, tries to diminish the destructive effects of war, and as well uh, to protect everyone against uh, the horrors of war. In doing so, we will follow a certain format in each and every episode. The gist of the idea is that we will have a guest uh, every time, uh, who a guest who is a practitioner uh, or an expert in the relevant field chosen for the uh, episode. So the guest that we will host during our podcast will always be a person who has studied at the Geneva Academy and therefore acquired a very solid background on the relevant legal frameworks that are applicable to and in wars. A good opportunity, really, to discover what the former students of the Geneva Academy actually have begun since they graduated, what they do, and how the knowledge that they've obtained at the Geneva Academy can be used on the ground. I think this is very special, at least it's special to me in because not only, of course, the guests are former students and therefore they might have been the former students of my course in international criminal law. So I'm very curious to discover what they have become with the passing of the years. Uh, but I think that also we shall clarify to our listeners that when we invite a guest, we don't tell the guest uh, the questions we will be asking. Uh, but of course, uh, we, we, we share with our guests the topic that we wanted to discuss. Uh, then we prepare, we study uh, before the actual interview takes place uh, because each of us is a specialist in the field of international law and also we have some experience in podcasting so we know that we have to try to keep our interviews as spontaneous as possible. Uh, indeed, Paola. Uh, we want to be informative, we want to make the podcast interesting but we also want to make it a bit entertaining. Now, Antonio and Paola, I think it's really about time to tell to our listeners what actually is the Geneva Academy and why are we even producing this podcast? 
well, I'm very proud to say what is the Geneva Academy since I've been uh, a former director of the Geneva Academy until 2014, together with my friend and colleague, Andrew Clapham. Uh, the Geneva Academy is a joint center of the University of Geneva and of the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies. It was established in 2007 as the successor of the QD, this is uh, an abbreviation which stands for Centre Universitaire de Droit International Humanitaire, which is Centre for International Humanitarian Law. And the Geneva Academy, as the predecessor, the QD, offers uh, master's uh, training programs on humanitarian law and human rights, but also carries out academic research as well as policy studies on a variety of themes related to wars, but also other situations of humanitarian crisis. So let me mention that this podcast series really is trying to supplement and add to the already very rich scope of activities and different projects that the Geneva Academy does uh, as a leading institution in the field of international humanitarian law, human rights, and transitional justice. But in addition, among the reasons why we are doing this podcast precisely this year, it is because it is a very special birthday for the Geneva Academy, which turns 50 in this year. So why this title, In and Around Wars? It was the subject of discussions within our team for a while. Uh, Paola and other people pitched in. And perhaps in choosing the title, we were a bit influenced by the fact that um, Professor Andrew Clapham, former director of the Academy, has recently published a book called War. But not only that, we felt that the expression war still has some legal significance. And we wanted to uh, bring this legal significance into the fore of discussions, even though for the past 70 years after the Second World War, perhaps the expression that is used more often is armed conflict following the language of the relevant treaties. So I think it's not the moment to hear from, from Andrew Clapham who, what he actually thinks of the term war and why he has given to his book the title War. So Professor Clapham, you have recently published a book with Oxford University Press. The title of the book is War, and the main issue that you explore in this book is how relevant is the concept of war today. Even though resorting to war as an instrument of foreign policy has been abolished a long time ago. So could you explain to our listeners why did you decide to use the term war? Indeed, I, I was aware that some legal effects only follow from a formal state of war. And by that, I mean that a war has been formally declared. And in the book, I call this war with a capital W. So, for example, in national law, the crime of trading with the enemy only applies in time of formal war. And I discovered this quite concretely when I was asked to do a legal advice for Iraq in 2003 on how to ratify the Rome Statute. And I double checked and I was told that war had not been declared by Her Majesty in Parliament. And therefore, the United Kingdom was not at war. And for me to give unpaid advice was indeed uh, not a crime. And there are many uh, examples, particularly in uh, Anglo American law, where in national law, the concept of aiding the enemy becomes relevant if you're in a time of war because it leads to the crime of treason. And the crime of treason around the world often can still carry the death penalty. So it's significant to know whether you're in a war or not because it could be a life or death situation. And in fact, on the death penalty question, um, I discovered in doing the book that there are several human rights treaties that abolish the death penalty, except in time of war. And if you scratch the surface and you go into the travel and the expert readings, you'll find that, in fact, that means a formal state of war, a formal declared war. So if a state party to one of those human rights treaties tried to execute someone in a civil war or a non-international armed conflict or an armed conflict, which was not an interstate war properly declared as a formal state of war, that would indeed be a breach of human rights and a violation of international law. So there are these, you could think of them as sort of quite obscure areas, but uh, in fact, the harder you go, the more you find that there are several areas of law, national law and international law, where it makes a difference whether you're in a war or an armed conflict. This could be a question of military justice, it could be naval warfare, it could be prize law, 
All of those in some states will require a formal state of war for certain effects to kick in. But in thinking about war, I noticed that beyond these formal questions, when you introduce this word, you start to shift what is happening in your argumentation. So one could have an argument about targeting, and you could present it in quite a clinical way between distinguishing civilian objects from military objects. But I noticed that if you rephrase this and you say, well, this object, this oil refinery or these oil tankers are part of the war-sustaining economy, it, it shifts the argument and it makes it more obvious in the eyes of some that you should be entitled to attack them. And so the point of the book was really to draw attention to people to say, look, when somebody else is using the expression war, look what they're trying to do. Are they, are they trying to justify what they're doing in a way by implication? So for Guantanamo, they are not referred to as prisoners. They're referred to as law of war detainees, which makes it all found very justifiable and legal. Um, and of course, that's not to go into the question of what if somebody is talking about a just war. So the word war is actually doing a lot of work every day um, behind the scenes, and that's what I wanted to highlight. And lastly, I, I also concluded that we sometimes need to emphasize the word war, and it reminds us about the horror of war. If we refer to something as an IAC or a NIAC or an Article 3 conflict, it's quite clinical. It almost sanitizes uh, what is happening. But when you talk about rape as a weapon of war, or you start a coalition to stop the war, it, it has an emotive effect. And it reminds you that the war is hell and that what happens in war is, is catastrophic. It's not just a sort of classroom exercise. And I suppose after quite a long time at the academy, I, I'm sort of kicking back about the sort of overly scientific way in which we sometimes um, address these things. So no one is entitled to engage in war anymore, as you said, it's been abolished. And all violence has to be limited. But I think that by focusing on war rather than the rules of an armed conflict, we can get away from the idea that these are rules to ensure a level playing field. We shouldn't really be thinking about war as a game. It's hell, and we should be seeking to stop it and not regulate it. And I'm actually against war, and that's really what I was trying to say. Thank you. So thank you so much for, for this explanatory answer. And, you know, as you spoke, you mentioned the words, the terms IAC and NIAC. Would you maybe explain to our listeners why did you use these words and where do they actually mean? Yes, of course. Um, and I'm sorry if they were alienating, but I used them precisely to show how quickly we slip into the jargon and how, in fact, I prefer that we talk about war rather than IAC and NIAC. So an IAC is an international armed conflict, and the NIAC is a non-international armed conflict. And the way in which these terms are used are, in my experience, often done in a way that suggests that because we are in one of these types of conflicts, certain levels of detention or violence or killing are justified, and that uh, these things are an incidental part of uh, the armed conflict and of waging war. And that's precisely, I suppose, what I wanted readers and listeners to question that if somebody says this flows naturally from war or this flows naturally from an IAC, question what is going on? Who, who gave the authority to, to detain? Who gave the, what's the justification morally and legally for killing? It can't be that these things just flow naturally from war because as you yourself, Anna, said at the beginning, war has been outlawed. So nothing can flow naturally as a right or a belligerent in war. Now our listeners might have recognized that the voice uh, in the introduction or in the intro of this podcast uh, is Professor Clapham voice. And his voice will also be the voice in the outro of this podcast. So we are very happy that in this way he also contribute to celebrate uh, the anniversary of the establishment of the Geneva Academy. There will be five episodes in the season and episode one covering terrorism and war will be released very soon. So please tune in and subscribe everywhere you listen to podcasts. Thank you for listening to us, and goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. You've been listening to In and Around Wars, a podcast of the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. 
If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and stay tuned for more inspiring conversations with Geneva Academy alumni. You can also check the Geneva Academy's website at www.geneva-academy.ch to find more resources and upcoming events on contemporary issues of international humanitarian law and policy.